The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. That's Euclid. Basic geometry. Only you're smarter. It's easy, after all. You know how the investigators work. You're a student of cop think. So you stay one step ahead of them. No straight lines. You program a route into your phone. They won't expect. It'll take a bit longer, but it'll still get you where you want to go. Sure, it shook you up a week ago when the authorities announced they were looking for a white Hyundai Elantra. You'd been sloppy. Who'd have thought you'd get caught on a surveillance camera in a one-horse town like Moscow, Idaho? But you were already one step ahead of them. So what if they had a photo of the Hyundai? With a single Pennsylvania plate, that's not you anymore. You'd quickly registered the car in Washington and attached a new set of plates. Resto. That's why you've gotten away with it for six weeks. And you'll keep on getting away with it. Because you're smarter than they are. Even better, you're lucky. You have the perfect cover. Your father along for the trip, riding shotgun. What could be more innocent? All you need to do is keep driving. You'll be home for the holidays. 2,500 miles. Nearly the width of the entire country. Between you and and those Keystone cops. Sell the car back east and they'll never know. You'll have the last laugh. Again. Killing is easy. And so is getting away with it. Doubtless, these are only speculations. The hard facts, especially for a case that has held the nation's attention for the past three months like a magnet, are frustratingly narrow. Brian Koberger, a 28-year-old doctoral candidate in the Criminal Justice and Criminology Department at Washington State University, has been charged with four counts of first-degree murder and one count of felony burglary as the lone assailant in the November 13 stabbing deaths of four University of Idaho students, Madison Mogan, Kaylee Gonsalves, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin. And since Koberger last week purposively waived his right to a speedy preliminary hearing, preparation trumped timeliness, his attorney explained. It will not be until late June, another five long and vexing months, before the Idaho prosecutors at last divulge all the incriminating cards they have tucked up their sleeves. Over the course of what is expected to be at least four hard charging and affecting days, prosecutors will strive to convince a judge that they have accumulated sufficient evidence to proceed to trial. And the defense, acting on their client's wishes, will reveal whether it intends to fight the allegations with all its legal might, or if it will surrender Koberger to the presumed mercy of the court and have him plead guilty. The outcome of this decision is likely a matter, literally, of life or death. Idaho has established an execution chamber where the lives of the judicially condemned are ended with a catheterized drip of a four-solution lethal cocktail. Yet regardless of what is determined at that still distant preliminary hearing, it seems self-evident that the next stage of Brian Koberger's complicated life, a pained existence lived by his own admission under a treacherous star, was set in motion by the road trip that took him across America and home to the Pocono Mountains for the Christmas holidays, a journey that ultimately brought him to his present forlorn destination, a cell in the Latal County, Idaho jail, where he is being held without bail. And with equal certainty, it can be said that Koberger made his way back home and then celebrated the Christmas season in the bosom of his family. It was also a time when the small army of law enforcement officers who had been chasing this perplexing case since its unnerving start began to grow convinced that at least in operational terms, things had clarified. They knew as any pack of bloodhounds would know, that they had the scent. And although they dared not breathe a word to the media, 
or, for that matter, even to their weary loved ones. They were closing in. Old Antagonisms Michael Koberger was worried about the snow. Only days earlier, he had flown from Philadelphia to Seattle, then caught a twin-engine Embraer 170 jet for the one-hour-or-so shuttle flight into the frigid Pullman-Moscow Regional Airport. And now, December 13th, he was already heading back home. Only this time, it'd be a road trip. It was a fatiguing back-and-forth cross-country jaunt especially for a 67-year-old. But Koberger had promised his son, Brian, who had nearly a month off before classes resumed at Washington State University, that he'd accompany him on the drive back home for the Christmas break. And he was determined to make good on his pledge. Over the years, there had been some rough, combative times between the two of them. He'd even had to get Brian into rehab to kick his teenage heroin habit. But now, the young man seemed to be on a good path. Studying for a Ph.D. in criminal justice offered a promising career trajectory for Brian. And it can be imagined, it must have puffed up a father with, with a prideful sense of parental accomplishment. After all, Michael's own life had been tarnished by not one, but two embarrassing bankruptcies. And his work days were a drudgery spent as a maintenance man at the dreary high school his three children had attended. Perhaps he was even looking forward to this trip as a way to revitalize his relationship with his son, a way to bury once and for all any lingering remnants of their old antagonisms. But now Michael, as he'd later recount to an associate, was largely focused only on the forecast. When it snowed in the northwest, the accumulations were routinely measured in feet, not inches. Michael knew, and so he wanted to get going. When the weather came in, it'd be rough traveling in a seven-year-old Hyundai Elantra. Without four-wheel drive, you'd be slipping and sliding all over the road. So he urged Brian they should pack up and get going. Now. His son agreed. Only once they were on the road, Brian did something. His father would later casually share with one of the mechanics at the garage near their home in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania, who'd serviced the car after the trip that had caught him by surprise. Before Michael had headed out to Washington, he'd Googled the route back home. The quickest, most logical drive was pretty much a straight line, plowing across the country along I-90. Brian, however, button-hooked south towards Colorado, where he'd pick up I-70. It seemed to make little sense. Colorado in mid-December was snow country. There was no telling what might suddenly come blowing down from the Rockies. But Brian, according to what his father told people, insisted the northern route across I-90 promised wintry conditions. Better to head away from the weather, even if it added hours or even a day to the trip. It was a strategy that, when explained, that reasonable way was practical, even prudent. But it seemed like something more devious to the FBI, unknown to either the father or the son. The Bureau had been determined to keep a watchful eye on the white Hyundai's trek across America. Only sources in law enforcement would confide with a bristle of embarrassment. Not long after the car had pulled out of its space in the graduate housing parking lot, fronting 1630 Northeast Valley Road in Pullman, Washington, they lost it. For several alarming hours or more, the authorities are keeping the precise details of this screw-up close to the vest. The chief suspect in a quadruple homicide that had shocked the nation had seemingly vanished. A 
an explosive secret. The Bureau's watchers called it a hat box operation. And the jargon was a bit of an anachronism. It was a throwback to an era when G-men sporting fedoras over their real creamed hair would be out in force on the street to monitor a target's every move. A sea of hats would box the suspect in. These days, the watchers have a few more tricks at their disposal. Undercover vehicles, surveillance vans, low-flying fixed-wing planes, and that's just for starters. But the name has stuck. And the surveillance on Brian Koberger, according to published reports and interviews with officials, was hatbox all the way. With good reason, too. To the investigators' rising sense of excitement, the circumstantial theory they'd been secretly incubating for weeks was growing stronger and stronger. Back on November 25th, Moscow PD had whispered to local lawmen to keep their eyes peeled for a white 2011 to 2016 Hyundai Elantra. One had been caught on surveillance video dashing about the neighborhood not far from the King Road crime scene in the early morning hours immediately following the murders. Four days later, Daniel Tiango, a Washington State police officer, was diligently spending the midnight hours on his graveyard shift going through the inventory of white Elantras registered at the university. And up popped one belonging to a Brian Koberger. A half hour later, another WSU officer drove over to the graduate student parking lot and eyeballed the vehicle. Only to discover the car now had Washington state plates. Later in the still new morning, this morsel of intelligence, interesting, certainly nothing provocative, was passed on to Corporal Brett Payne. The gung-ho former Army MP, who was the Moscow Police's lead investigator, Payne dutifully typed the car's registration details into the motor vehicle's record system. And the screen quickly displayed a photograph of Brian Koberger, as well as his state's driver's license information. The license revealed that Koberger is a white male and a sturdy six feet and 185 pounds. But it was the photograph that held Payne's studious gaze. He swiftly zeroed in on the eyebrows. They were bushy. And that, Payne realized with a mounting sense of triumph, was precisely the sort of telltale clue they'd been praying for over the past two weeks. All along, since the first days of the grim case, he and the small inner circle of investigators had been guarding an explosive secret. They had an eyewitness. Dylan Mortensen, one of the two 19-year-old surviving roommates, had seen the killer. At a little past 4 a.m., just about when the detectives theorized the four students had been hacked to death, she heard a plaintive cry. Anxious, she opened the door to her second floor room and saw someone. A man dressed ominously in black was walking towards her. He was, she'd vividly recall, the details forever etched deep in her memory. At least five foot ten, not bulked up, but still trim like an athlete. And he wore a mask that covered his mouth and nose, but not his eyes or his eyebrows. A profound and vehement fear seized hold of her. A frozen shock phase was how she would try to describe her galloping emotions. But the black-clad intruder continued past her as if she were invisible and headed towards a sliding glass door that led out of the house. For reasons that continue to be bound tight with the bands of mystery, Dylan returned to her room, locked the door, and didn't emerge until after 11 a.m. Only then did she summon friends who, in a state of full-blown panic, at last 
called 911. Be sure to check out my other videos and playlists for more true crime content. And if that's not enough, you can join our Patreon. Don't have a tinfoil hat? It's okay. We'll make you one. It's that easy. See you guys in the next video. See you later. Bye.